Recording is on. Okay. So all the info about the meeting is up on the wiki and the slides are published there. Do we have a scribe? You don't have to take absolutely detailed notes, but any decision should be in the minutes. Someone volunteering? We often draft Henrik, but I guess Henrik isn't here to be drafted. I'm new to the group, but I'll, I'll, I can take notes if you guys want. OK, thank you very much. All right, as Harold noted, the meeting is being recorded, and it will become public. All right, so this is the list of issues for uh, discussion today. I'd now like to turn it over to Sergio for a somewhat difficult note. Sergio. Yeah, yeah. as most of you already know, uh, Dr. Alex passed away last 8th of April in a car accident in Thailand. I mean, this has been devastating, especially for his family and all the people that were with him in, in Singapore and, and, and the rest of Cosmo and Milka's team. I mean, many of you know Dr. Ares even for longer that I have known him, so I don't think that I think it is needed to explain how Alex was or how big his personality was. I would only say that I think that he was omnipresent, so he was involved in everything. And at least for me, it will be very difficult to not feel his presence in, in anything in anything that we are doing because he was involved in almost everything. So, <laughs> I mean, and and I still can can process the news. So it's it's like he's not happened. So and I can I have, and I think uh, and every every step I take, I I can I think I can f hear his voice still in my mind and. And it is really difficult to, to think about him has passing away. So we are taking care of his family in Singapore and in France. So we are trying to to help them with all the process and because it is going to it is has been very difficult in, in Thailand and repatriating his body to France. So we are trying to set up some kind of memorial or or charity fund in his name. But uh, we have to respect his family wishes, and everything is too recent. So I know that many of people, m m many of you, has asked me how uh, to send anything for the funeral or anything like that. But I will ask you to, to wait a bit more until we are able to to find a good way to to pass our condolences to the to their families. And I mean, if if. Um, I know that he will have love us to, to continue working on, on WebRTC and, and things and getting things going. So I think I'll just take a deep breath and just continue with the meeting. And if anyone was to wants to say anything, just the floor is yours. Yeah, I'd like to say, Sergio, that one of the remarkable things about Dr. Alex was that he he enjoyed doing things on the cutting edge, even if it was very high risk. Um, and in particular, the work he did on AV1 uh, to test it and, and write the test suite and all of the work he's done on WebRTC testing, they were the kind of things that don't get a lot of recognition that are very hard to do, but, but he really loved that kind of thing. He never shied away from uh, the, the edge, the cutting edge. He always wanted to be on the cutting edge. Yeah. And that's, we, yeah. yeah. We will try to continue working like that. I mean, he... Yeah, for Cosmo and for Milikas, he, he set up a vision and we will try to, to still be able to collaborate and, and work on, on cutting edge things and helping with RTC, but obviously with him will be much harder and well, it will take yeah. a time to, to settle. Anybody else want to say a few words? Okay. So I, I think I, just, just one thing worth saying maybe. Yeah. If, if, if I may, um, I think we, I mean, I can say this because I'm not kind of part of any of the browser teams, but I think the fact that we've got several browsers implementing WebRTC now is in no small part due to Dr. Alex um, proving that there was a demand for it by, by doing plugins and, and needling people back in the day that, you know, yeah, Safari did need to be able to do WebRTC and yeah, 
um, you know, IE did need WebRTC and, and that there was demand, commercial demand for it. I think his his willingness, as, as Sergio says, to take on like difficult things and go do them um, uh, allowed him to do that. And, and we're all much the richer for it. Um, I think it's a, you know, it's a real tribute to him that. Yeah, I, I also wanted to say that Dr. Alex is probably the first WebRTC community uh, guy I met, I actually met in person. And uh, it was uh, very uh, inspiring and very, it, it was a very warm welcome uh, for me into the WebRTC community. And uh, that was just great to, 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 see, to see that, like his ability to connect people and to put positive energy was also great. Yeah, I think that next meeting that we make in person will not be the same with his dinners and his present for sure. I also recall Dr. Alex being an early supporter of getting promises into the WebRTC APIs uh, at a contentious time. And I really appreciate uh, still his support and uh, always looking to, toward uh, new and uh, future things. And I will certainly say that we'll miss him. Yeah. I will miss him. Thank you, everybody. So I'd like to turn the floor over to Harold to talk about the Weber CPC extension process. Yep. So the when we got things to wreck, we 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 took on certain rec, certain restrictions to our process, which means that basically that once you have a, what uh, WGC calls a rec, it means that you you're not supposed to add things that are untested, unproven, and unimplemented. And the WTC process does allow us to recycle a, rec a recommendation that is at the rec stage and add new features, but they need to be features that that uh, have an appropriate level of implementation. And so I tried to, to figure out, OK, what guidelines could we make? And created the a pull request creating a new document in the repo that says here's how you how we processed basically we add new features to the rec to wtc pc when they have achieved the level of maturity that is appropriate for rec that is consensus implementation and tests that, that pass on list, at least two browsers. But of course, we have to have somewhere for these things to live without get well before they get that far. So the proposal is the simplest one I could think of, which is that we use the WebRTC extensions document as a scratch pad for small extensions, and we can write new documents like WebRTC priority or other things as small sharp documents that embed only a few features. And these are places where specs can incubate. And once we have looked at them, kicked the tires, discussed them a bit, and shown that we have consensus, we have a test suite and we have two implementations, then we can merge them to the main doc, if so desired. I mean, WebRTC extensions isn't the place to live. Other, other proposals might want to live in their own documents. The exception for that is bug fixes. If we have a bug or something that leads to interoperability problems in the spec, we should just fix it. And uh, we should aim to run this process not too frequently. Six months is 
seems like an appropriate thing to aim for. And uh, then we would have a new round of WebRTC PC with more features, or features taken away for that matter, if they turn out to be to be taken away from browsers. So this is the pull request. I have had a couple of comments on it that I need to integrate. But uh, I'd like to invite the group to have comments on the process that is being proposed. It was frankly the safest one I could think of. Anyone want to comment? I think it's a good idea for, for small things. Uh, otherwise, we'd end up with uh, a million documents. Yeah. Um, but you and I also think it, it makes some sense. Um, I would just maybe uh, add a subtlety that maybe you can have consensus on an extension. And then it promotes it as a working group draft and blah, 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 and we work on it and we work on it and so on. And then six months or one year later, we have two implementations, and then we merge in with CPC. And so there might be like three three steps, like proposal from the wild, then proposal where there's consensus to fix it within the working group, and then uh, final stage in with CPC. Yep, we shouldn't assume that we have consensus at the beginning of the at the beginning of an extension, but we need somewhere for the extensions to live. I think for the for things that go into WebRTC extensions, which should, should just to use mockup to call 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 out that distinction. I'll then make it. Can you make file a bug, file a file a comment on the PR that's saying that? Uh, sure, I, I can summarize it in, in the PR. Great. Yes. So, uh, Janiver here. <clears throat> I think I largely agree. Uh, I'm only a little concerned about. Um, the repo WebRTC extensions itself, because it's um, it's uh, not a document of a specific proposal, but it's a a place where all kinds of APIs can be added, whether they're good ideas or not. And um, so, just to, uh, this sort of is a separate question, I guess, whether we should uh, for new ideas of a certain size, they're probably better served with trying to get a uh, consensus on a working draft uh, so that we don't, uh, I was concerned we don't skip that, that process of getting group consensus on a working draft new API um, by uh, it landing in WebRTC extensions. But other than that, I think the process, uh, this sounds good. And I, an idea for that, I mean, uh, for WebRTC PC, we, we added stuff and then at some point we added these uh, notes that said uh, implementation at risk. And I'm wondering if we could do that, but backwards here where we add the uh, boxes saying, uh, you know, consensus reached or something. Would that make sense? So that we oh, don't yeah. have to spawn new documents. In wherever to see extensions. Yeah. Yeah. Like by default, they're at risk, but once we think uh, we have an agreement to implement them, we, we mark them as ready to implement or something. Yeah. Well, maybe as a way to deal with extensions that exist now, but as a process going forward, I would rather we don't have documents that don't have consensus there to begin with. Because uh, I think seeing documents uh, in the W3C repo uh, can be very confusing to people about how much. Uh, so, it, so it, I'm not sure readers will see the absence of such a label as a deterrent to uh, to understand that this is not uh, uh, does not does, uh, does not have a consensus. Does that make sense? Uh, frankly, ma manipulating uh, people's implementation decisions by man manipulating labels is uh, well. It could maybe work, but in practice, it often doesn't. So I would uh, hesitate to make more, things more complicated than it has to. And Frankly, we have added a lot of stuff that didn't have consensus at the outset because we because we're pretty unable to come to concrete discussions without a concrete proposal. 
So I'm slightly concerned about what the Tim Panton here, what, what the web developers view of this is like somebody coming into the process from the outside, it, it needs to be reasonably clear what they would expect a browser to do. And, and I think like some of the extensions will be some of the things in the extension document will will happen in your browser and some of them won't. And I think that's a that's visually a bit confusing. Mm. I don't know how you like maybe there's a marking or a formatting or a versioning or something that allows you to cope with that. But I, I think that's a challenge for like the web developer wandering into this. I mean, so we, what, we what, have a, had that with all features. That's uh, where we where we got uh, feature at risk and things being ripped out. So one approach we could take, one approach we could take, and that has been adopted in other specs. Um, there are no mechanisms, both in uh, respect and backshed, the tools we use to edit the specs to display data about. Uh, which browser implement which uh, feature. Right. Um, and so provided we also maintain that data or make sure it gets maintained uh, in MDN because that comes from MDN, um, then we could have that displayed along with the feature description, which uh, gives more clarity about the exact uh, usability of the said uh, feature. Yes, uh, we also have other tools. Yeah, we, we also have other tools like we have incubator specs. Uh, we have private repos. I don't see a problem with discussion issues being filed in private repos for talking about um, having the working group dis discuss uh, primitive or immature ideas uh, that things that need more big time. And maybe we can take a cue from other. Um, organizations that we have uh, more consensus ahead of uh, adding spec pros into w3c documents i think would be great but but uh, we're talking about the early end here and i think uh, as far as talking about the late end near rec i think uh, uh, i largely agree with that, that part that side yeah so in the interest of time i suggest uh, please make more comments on the on the pr and we'll uh, probably send out a note to the to the mail list saying we think this PR is ready for adoption. Say say yes or file a bug. Yes, uh, please put that in the minutes that I think is an action item. Both of those are action items. Yep. Thank you. OK, thank you. OK, a uh, little bit of discussion on testing. Um, two meetings ago, we had a test pr proposal, which is to create something called an echo server and a prototype was done. It seemed to work well. Basically, what it did is it captured packets that were, uh, there was a server that captured packets that were sent to it and sent them back over WebSockets. And so it allowed, made it possible to test a bunch of protocol behavior, which hadn't been testable before. Um, and FIPPO wrote a couple of tests to test whether NACs and buys were being sent appropriately, VP8 simulcast, lots of stuff. Uh, so this seemed like an interesting idea. Um, and so we've been trying to move forward to get this server uh, put up on WPT. I guess you, when you've been following up with Jeremy, and there was an issue with the CRC32 library, um, and no objection, I guess, from from Jeremy. But uh, the work hasn't started. So, is there anything, any action item we need to take, uh, UN, to to move forward? Um, maybe I, maybe we should file an actual issue on the AI or RTC uh, repo. Okay. Uh, I, I, did, I didn't have an answer from Jeremy Lane. I was uh, thinking to wait for this issue to be fixed before asking the WPT force. Um, but uh, I can also try to do that in parallel. I, I don't know what the WebRT working group thinks about that. Uh, I think it's probably a good idea to at least start writing up the RFC uh, so that the group, for instance, yeah. here could comment on it and possibly even submit it with the caveat on the licensing question if that hasn't gotten solved in the meantime. Yeah, that, that sounds like a good idea. Try to do the things in parallel. Wow. Okay, sounds good. 
Okay, so for the minutes, please note that we'll move forward on the RFC and uh, in parallel trying to try to address the licensing issue. Okay, thank you. All right, uh, so we're moving on to the rest of the discussion. So um, this is a little slide about something that had been an ice box. It's, it's where emergency extensions. Uh, the idea was to introduce a request keyframe API. It's a little bit of a misnomer because it's not about requesting keyframes, it's about generating them. And uh, the reason it was put in the ice box was there were existing mechanisms that people were using to cause a sender to generate a keyframe. But um, we found they have some limitations. One of the limitations is that the WebRTC CPC spec doesn't talk about keyframe generation anywhere. So it doesn't say that a keyframe should be generated by these mechanisms. And as a result, there aren't any tests um, that actually make sure that keyframes are generated. So an example of something that people are using, I believe, is sender.replace track. With use, you pass an argument of the same track you already have. Um, now, all the spec says is you should seamlessly transition to sending the new track. It doesn't say you should send the keyframe. Um, and uh, developers have found that as a result, this is not reliable. Sometimes it generates a keyframe on some browsers, sometimes it doesn't. Um, I think there's a theory that there's a race condition that, that makes it unreliable. Another thing that's been suggested is twiddling the active attribute in encodings. So you can set active false and then back to true. Um, that, I guess, could cause a keyframe to be generated. Again, the spec doesn't require it. But the problem is if you do that, you'd probably cause a stutter. So you might miss uh, the video Michael Black or something. So none of these things, because the spec doesn't mandate keyframe generation, um, it, it's not clear you can really depend on them in an application. And, and there's no tests. Uh, and it probably would be uh, valid to object to adding a test, given that the spec doesn't actually say you, you should generate a keyframe. So the proposal here is to have a new API. Um, I would suggest it be called generate keyframe rather than request keyframe, because it's not about really about requests, it's about generating them. Um, and uh, with an argument of the encodings that will be reset. So you can specify the encodings, I guess, by number or maybe by RIDs. So you pass in a, a sequence. Uh, and the effect of this would be the same as receiving an FIR with SSRCs that correspond to the target streams. Now, uh, the uh, effect of, of that is not it may differ between implementations. For example, in Chrome, it causes all streams to be reset, not just the one that's referenced with an SSRC. Uh, because one encoder is being used, you kind of have to reset the state of the encoder, not just the stream. Um, but that's that's okay. Um, it, it basically has the same effect as an FIR. Um, so this is we do have uh, potential developers who would use this uh, if it were defined, because uh, like we said, uh, the existing spec doesn't doesn't have a reliable and well defined way to do it. Any comments? Uh, could you talk about why web developers are doing this? The use case. Um, is um, is Maxim on the call? Okay. Uh, basically, um, I think it's in a in a case where uh, people uh, join or leave uh, a conference uh, where where you'd want to basically uh, generate generate a keyframe. Um, potentially, also. As an example, when when your uh, conference server switches between simulcast encodings, you need to uh, you need to generate a keyframe as well. Um, you could do that by sending an FIR to the participant to get them to to resend, or you could uh, generate it. Um, you could send like a, instead of sending an FIR, you could send a, a something over the data channel and then and then call this API uh, to generate a keyframe. I, I, I have a different. A slightly different use case because oh, okay. you, you could argue that this this could be targeted by just yes, RTCP uh, fear and, and picture loss indication. So, uh, but there is one use case when you cannot do it is if you are using end-to-end -end encryption, 
and you are doing the encryption via insertable string. If you change the the key because someone is uh, is joining as the key exchange is asynchronous, it's not sync with the with the media. It happened that the that the key is not sent exactly when the or is set on a knife frame. So um, you want to make sure that when you you are sending a, with the this new key. Uh, for this partitive participant that has joined, you are sending it on an on an iframe. I think that this was also the original request. Uh, had I'll specify it or, or, or uh, was originally proposed by Harald due to that, because mm -hmm. because doing end to end encryption it is something that is controlled in the client. You cannot, for obvious reasons, control it on the SVU. And, and due to the nature of the asynchronous uh, key exchange, uh, you need to, to control it on the client side, not on the SVU. So talking about the end-to-end -end encryption case, uh, usually encryption will be done not in main thread. So that, that's why when I first initially heard about this use case, I thought it would be better to put this API uh, in WebRTC and get it transformed. Uh, context, which is where you set the key, so you will also request the keyframe uh, roughly at the same time, and you have like good uh, ordering behavior. Um, in this use case, uh, that uh, Maxim expressed uh, on the GitHub issue, I think uh, it's it's fine to use send sender generate keyframe, uh, but fear would be fine as well. I think that uh, I would be much more interested in having generate keyframe if, if there was uh, maybe not a must, but a should uh, constraint that you only tap trigger a keyframe on a specific encoding and not on all encodings. Um, that, that way we would be in a better situation than with uh, fear. Of course, there might be encoders that are doing everything in parallel and it, it might not be implementable. But in most cases, it's implementable today and we should just do that. Yeah, so that's why the argument has provided uh, UN so that implementations can do that. I guess it would be uh, you know, a separate argument whether, whether you know, it's, it's allowable to reset the whole encoder or not. But. I mean, I, I would go with a should because I, yeah. I don't think we, we, can, we can go with a must and there might be implementations where it's not feasible that implementers should do as much as they can to actually try to fulfill the promise. OK, so we're going to uh, update PR 37, I guess, with Harold's permission uh, to go in this uh, direction um, and um, have more discussion. So ju just slight comment on PR 37. I think it was uh, based on chaining operation. And I'm not sure we want to chain operations there because we probably want to generate the keyframe as soon as we as we can. Right. Yeah. The the reason why it, uh, I suggested chaining the operation was uh, because uh, if you do if you do generate keyframe and replace track, and uh, then you want to be very sure whether the keyframe that the that the generate keyframe consistently happens either before or after the replace track. So uh, since uh, re re since replace track was on was on the operations chain, I thought uh, the simplest way to make make sure it was consistent was to add it on the operations chain. And if you if there's another reason why this is not uh, this is not racy, then I'm fine with uh, with not not doing a chaining of it. Well, maybe maybe we should. Uh, some concern was raised here also about uh, inconsistent behavior on race re replace track. So maybe we could address that at the same time and maybe say something like replace track should uh, generate a keyframe as well. Will that solve the race? Well, then I'm a little bit unsure about whether whether replace track should should generate a keyframe when it, it, when you're changing from one one black stream to another black stream. It doesn't seem to make sense, but uh, I wouldn't mind if it right. 
Yeah, so, I mean, the, the weird thing here is it, it says it should be seamless. If you think about it, the most seamless way to uh, do a replace track on an existing track is to do nothing at all, right? <laughs> I mean, so it wasn't right. it wasn't clear to me that it it, it, it certainly didn't even seem to imply uh, generating a keyframe in that in that uh, kind of a case. Uh, yes, and that's something we could clarify in replace track. I, I actually looked, and I don't see there's a, you know, the simple line if with track equals existing sender track, then you know, resolve promise. <laughs> And don't do anything. Something like that would at least clarify a replace track. Yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, I think we have the next step, which is basically comment on the PR and and try to get it closer to uh, to to being finished. All right. So I'm going to turn the floor over to I guess Harold and Guido. Go ahead, Harold. Yeah, so Guido, do you want to speak to this? OK, I can start, and then you can talk uh, whenever you want to add yeah. something. Yeah. So um, basically, we want to report on the current status of breakout box, and we are proposing to adopt adopt it as a working group document as an initial point to uh, discuss and address all these um, the use cases that we intend to support with this api so the status of implementation is that while it's implemented in chromium so it's, it's in chrome and ash uh, it's available as an origin trial in since chrome uh, 90. Uh, the, it's part of the web codex origin trial actually uh, uh, since um, it's used uh, frequently together with web, with web codex and it's uh, replacing an uh, an API that was originally part of web codex, so it's easier for for existing participants to to migrate by keeping the same in trial. Uh, the in trial has uh, uh, more than fifty signups, of which at least eight are experimented uh, experimenting with breakout box. The feedback uh, from the developer has been positive in general. Uh, many appreciate the ability to do processing on workers. And yes, and this, uh, there are uh, among signups, uh, there are uh, applications in active development by Zoom and by Google Meet. Uh, next. I'm going to go over the issues that are opened on the on the repository, just to explain the uh, well, what the status is with regards to those issues, and then we'll have also opportunity to discuss even more since Juan has uh, plenty of slides with with additional feedback. Uh, so the the first issue, or uh, well, not the first one, but the 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 first one I'm going to talk about is uh, the initial whether using readable and writable streams is uh, the right approach. And my argument is that it is, at least at this time, because using streams allows us to leverage uh, a lot of mechanisms that are already proven in production, uh, like uh, direct uh, support for workers, it's a it's a API that's being used on on other APIs, so developers uh, know it. it. It has a well known program model, and it's suitable for what we want to do, which is basically providing a stream of 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 uh, media chunks. Uh, the other question is would be whether separating readable and writable is a good idea instead of having uh, at the transform approach like like we are adopting on on the encoded uh, transform and in this case uh, uh, our position is that separating readable and writable allows us to better support more use cases uh, like not just the the transform case but also the custom sync case uh, which which uh, doesn't require the output to be uh, uh, another track just reading from the track and doing something with it 
uh, and this is the way Zoom is using it uh, together with web, web codex and web transport uh, to implement their custom communication protocols. Uh, the same, the, the symmetric case would be custom sources. And there are other interesting cases, like for example, creating multiple source tracks. So, so you could combine two, two different existing tracks into another track by having uh, two processors and one generator and combine and have some sort of like a weather report uh, use case that has been proposed uh, where you have the combined the camera and for example a, a presentation together in a single track and yeah and so next uh, yes uh, another issue is a uh, memory management for incoming frames so for example what what if the upstream track or source produces more frames than, than can be consumed by JavaScript. So, so we have two mechanisms for that. So video frames and audio frames from web codex have, have a close method that allows releasing the resources uh, associated with the, with that frame. So, so it allows dropping frames with, with, uh, with precision. And the mainstream track processor also has an input buffer, uh, a circular one. Uh, that has a maximum size, so if, if uh, uh, it allows uh, the developer to control how to handle uh, certain bursts of data, uh, but if, 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 if the system cannot cope, then then the, the all frames from that buffer are dropped automatically. And yeah, and if you look at it, uh, like uh, uh, it could also be a problem with the platform sources and tracks. Like let's say you have you have some some source that produces a lot of uh, a lot more frames than 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 can be consumed by the, by the sinks connected to it, and uh, uh, implementations need to deal with that anyway. Uh, so mechanisms that that they use could could apply to 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 this as well. Uh, next, uh, then the another issue would be the opposite. What what happens if if uh, if um, it's more more like on on the consumer side, like like, like uh, you use the the generator uh, generates more frames than a sink can consume. So the question is how how does the application know about it? And yeah, so first, uh, well, the the idea is that that uh, this this intended this is intended to support the real time use case. So so a generator should produce uh, frames at a reasonably real time pace but even if if if, 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 if that doesn't happen then there are solutions to notify an application that it that it's going too fast uh, like for example the platform syncs can use their existing error reporting mechanisms like error events in media elements or maybe even peer connections uh, we could also use the in the generator uh, the proposal with double control uh, channel to to report that, or we could even have other other solutions like events on the generator. Or uh, so yeah, th th this is uh, open to discussion, but there are there are ways to to deal with it. Uh, and next. And the other one, which is actually the, the first uh, file issue, is uh, to add a high-quality face body tracking API to discourage porn discriminatory implementations. So basically adding a, a platform, a native transform, for uh, face body tracking. Uh, in regards to the X, I think we can uh, adopt a similar approach than the one we're taking in encoded transform. Just define a standard transformation for this. Uh, we can probably specify it on a on a separate uh, spec since since the details. I, well, I'm not an expert in the area, but uh, I would guess that the details might not be trivial. And look reasonably orthogonal to the core of the spec, but uh, yeah, so I, I see no problem in in us defining a standard transform for this. So I think that's it, and I think I. 
uh, I don't know if you want to add anything else, Harold, before. So, <clears throat> so what, uh, one oh. important thing to note is that, so that our implementation is currently uh, doing the right thing with threads, which is uh, that when you say send something to be worked on off the main thread, then uh, frames will not touch the main thread at all. So that was, uh, there was a preliminary version that came out in, I don't know, 89 or 90, that uh, did touch the main thread on frames, even, even if it was being processed elsewhere, but this bug has been fixed. So apart from that, I think we're good. So next we, we have another slide. So basically what we propose is to adopt the, the spec as a working group document, uh, which means uh, the, agreeing that we need this, uh, the problems that we're trying to solve these actually need solving and that we agree to uh, make all further changes under the, um, the supervision of a working group and that uh, well, the working group has the right and duty to make changes to the API in the interest of our community, like we have done with, or we do with all the other specs. So, so questions and comments? Um, <clears throat> so just about this slide slide, adopting the spec as a working group document. Um, I guess since I have feedback, um, related to the same spec, we we could go over uh, my slides and then come back to um, this uh, question, which is adopting the spec as a working group document. Does yeah, that, seem that's fine? In, that That seems logical. Are there other comments that want to come up at this point? Including comments saying, uh, if any, saying, uh, I tried this and it's great. <laughs> Oh, that caused Jan Yevar to drop out. <laughs> He's back. Oh, yeah, hi, Jan Yevar. <laughs> yeah, I will say that um, in terms of developer feedback that I've heard, uh, it was a little bit confusing that Web Codex used video track reader writer, um, and then that was pulled out in the second origin trial without breakout box being documented in its place. So we had a bunch of very puzzled developers who were trying video track reader writer and had to be redirected to breakout box. Um, and initially there wasn't any docs to provide them. So um, that may be the reason that you have 50 web codex people and only eight on breakout box. Yeah, Hi, Oliver here, sorry. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Oh yeah, so uh, yeah, I think I have uh, some concerns <clears throat> in that, uh, I believe, as a matter of process, we agreed to address the problem space. The working group ad agreed to address the problem space of uh, raw media access, and that we uh, ad adopted the uh, problem, but not necessarily the specific specification or the specific APIs. And <clears throat> so it leaves us an un un uh, unofficial draft at the moment, the GitHub re uh, repo seems to have mostly PRs from uh, from one company and doesn't have broad uh, involvement. And I think there's also been some uh, process confusion about what the status uh, and what the next steps there are. And so I'm glad that we're trying to address that now. Um, but uh, the, also what we talked about earlier about working drafts, uh, it's our understanding that uh, uh, Chrome is potentially planning to ship this, not just as an origin trial, which has already happened, but as an actual feature, even though the document hasn't really uh, been uh, adopted by the working group. So that is uh, concerning from a process standpoint. And I think uh, we want to make sure this has better review, uh, an overview from TAG, for instance, and uh, much more <clears throat> horizontal review before uh, if uh, if working draft is going to become the point at which uh, features are going to ship on the web, then I think we have to be uh, uh, be more cautious before approving 
uh, a draft until it's reached a wider consensus. <clears throat> I mean, uh, I, I do apologize that I did not did not get to this point in the March or February meeting. It would have been better and to adopt the adopt the spec as a working group document. Adopting the spec as a working group document does not mean first public working draft. That's a separate call. It does mean that uh, the the first public working draft is the next step. Right. At the same time, I think this raises a, an interesting challenge of where work is happening in multiple working groups. And it looks like uh, Web Codex and uh, WebRTC perhaps should um, work more closely to make sure things don't fall between between chairs, so to speak, no pun intended. Uh, the uh, one thing that, uh, for instance, stands out is that the uh, Web Codex apparently had a video track reader, but never had an audio track reader. So by deprecating video track reader in favor of breakout box breakout box also handles audio and i think uh no one no one caught that uh as a an area that hadn't been uh, uh widely discussed or discussed at all perhaps well so. we had we had we did have a discussion about the audio use case at the previous meeting i mean pre presented but not necessarily accepted we did we did have a discussion about it yeah. So yeah, uh, I think we can. Those are my feedback. Uh, if we want, UN wants to present That's this. Right. So, so you, UN, before we before going to your slide, where uh, do you want comments while you are running through them, or do you want to want to make your speech speech show through and collect comments at the end? Um, we are at the WPC, so and not IETF. So I would go with uh, comments. Uh, as they as they come, that's fine. Uh, I see that Dom Dom wants to speak. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to comment on the process bits. Um, so first, in terms of getting horizontal reviews, some of these horizontal reviews uh, we can only request once we've uh, adopted the document in some form. Like I know privacy interest group doesn't want to do early reviews. They want to get uh, things that have some level of consensus. So there's a bit of a, a chicken and egg issue if we were to, to wait uh, to get them all. Uh, with all that said, um, I think if there were going to be early shipping of uh, working drafts, um, I think whoever ships this draft needs to accept the responsibility of uh, possibly having to break existing applications while the uh, working group decides to uh, revise the API. Um, uh, and I think in particular, until we get to some clear level of consensus that this is the right uh, API shape, then um, you can't really raise your card, uh, oh, but this is going to, to break the web. Uh, I think this is like a, a two-edged sword uh, when you do early shipping that you you have to take responsibility for. Yeah, yeah. So I guess I meant my earlier statement that you know uh, we probably shouldn't be shipping ahead of horizontal review, and we probably shouldn't have horizontal review before a working draft. I don't think there's a, a conflict there. Correct. I I see Guido wants to. Oh, yeah. okay. Uh, yes. Uh, well, I just want to say that uh, we we have this under review by the tag, and we request a review. Yeah, I don't know, a couple of months ago, but uh, you know the tag is not uh, super fast uh, uh, when it comes to review. So, so yeah, we're, we're still waiting for the feedback. But yeah, uh, we didn't tend to ship this before adoption. So, we, so we we're requesting adoption before we can, as uh, as a previous step to us uh, considering shipping this. So, oh. uh, uh, so that's good to hear. To, to trying to uh, also, so on, on this similar topic, uh, we could also look at what happened for WebRTC and Codic Transform. Uh, last year in June, we agreed to adopt the working draft, knowing that the space was good, that the API had put some potential issues. Then if I'm not mistaken, uh, even though the spec did not reach first public working draft, it's still not the case. 
uh, Chrome shipped their original proposal. And then in November, we decided to change the API. And now we have uh, a spec uh, with a new API, but uh, the shipping API is not matching. And it's, uh, it's not great. And I hope we do not go there uh, with this proposal. And I want to make sure of that. Um, uh, that said, may, maybe I go ahead, Yanira. No, uh, go ahead. Uh, that said, maybe we can uh, to, uh, go to the next slide. Um, oh yes, just uh, just a comment there. I saw people uh, raising hands. I want to make sure that anyone wanted to speak now has an opportunity. I'm actually not sure how to track raise hands in yeah. Google Meet. Uh, hi, this is Chris Cunningham. Uh, I, I raised my hand briefly. Um, uh, the point about audio track reader not being in Web Codex uh, was not uh, just a, a matter of incremental progress on that specification. It was always a planned thing. Uh, and at the point where Web Codex uh, recognized the overlap with Breakout Box and, and the, basically the superior solution of Breakout Box, uh, it, it was removed from the web codex spec, you know, prior to, to, to adding audio track reader, just because we didn't get to it just yet. Um, but from the web codex side, we are supportive of having both audio and video in breakout box. All right, thanks. Any other comments? All right, Ewan, you want to go? Yep. Um... So last month, uh, I had a slide on my feedback for Media Capture Transform, but uh, it was the last slide of the meeting, so we were not able to, to go to it. So this time, uh, I did a few more slides to uh, describe a bit more my feedback. Uh, so the first slide is, uh, in the current draft, we have a transform for both audio and video. And for video, we we know that we need a better solution than Canvas. Um, we have we have African Canvas, which is sort of okay in workers, but still we, we need like to capture camera data. We need something better. For audio, it's a solved issue. Well, you have audio worklet, which is working fine. Zoom, for instance, is using audio worklet for microphone and for re remote audio rendering, and it's working well for them. So I, I don't know uh, whether Zoom is planning to use breakout box for audio. I don't know whether Google Meet is planning to use audio, uh, breakout box for audio as well. My guess is that uh, the most excitement comes from uh, targeting video. Now, uh, if we look at- Not, um, just that I don't agree with this. Uh, Audio worklet is a synchronous, a synchronous interface, which runs bang, 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 bang on the clock. Applications like uh, like uh, the the NetEQ API that I talked about last week, last month, cannot be done in in web audio because it does not fit its uh, processing model. So I don't agree that. Uh, that audio workload solves all the cases. Yeah, uh, Chris Cunningham, uh, I know you've been working with the beta testers of Web Codex. Do you have a comment on the audio versus video? Point? Um, yeah, we did. Uh, we did basically hold the same position as you in initially. Uh, you know, like audio workload seems like this should work. Um, we received feedback from uh, developers that um, kind of along the lines of Harold's uh, comment that. Uh, the real-time constraints of audio worklet mean that if you do, uh, if there's any sort of CPU hiccup or whatever, uh, that you end up dropping audio, um, uh, which is not a problem with the breakout box proposal. Uh, additionally, uh, while audio worklet is definitely um, part of the, the bigger picture with web codecs uh, in terms of audio rendering, uh, it's a lot of hoops to jump through uh, if you actually aren't planning to render your audio, you're just planning to encode it. Um, that's all. Paul, you want to talk? Yes. So there seems to be a misunderstanding. 
audio worklet is a low level api that is it, that is best used in combination with other apis to allow very advanced use cases with very high performance in particular it needs to be used with web worker and shared array buffer this is how you reconcile reconcile a push versus spell model and have the lowest latency possible on the machine we know that today there are implementation problems notably in chromium that prevents this to be done with very high performance and that has been ongoing for years right, since the shipping essentially is being resolved but it's not resolved this problem doesn't really affect other web browser we do run netaq from the real-time thread in firefox that doesn't cause any problem and we have much lower latency than other uh, implementations and that has been measured right so in fact we demonstrate technically and it's been shipped today that this is the superior model yeah i, I tend to agree uh, if you look at uh, separate implementation uh, you usually use a ring buffer and uh, this is typically what could be used with uh, audio worklet then the ring buffer you can take like two seconds three seconds four seconds whatever it will allow you the buffering that you do want uh, if you want like use if you want to use less memory half a second will, will make it work. So what I'm saying is that uh, audio worklet should solve all issues. We might still argue that uh, it might be not as convenient, whatever, but uh, I, I would go on there and say that um, if we look at media capture transform versus audio worklet, audio worklet is more reliable for sure. It's a high priority audio thread. A uh, worker usually is not high priority thread. It's usually interactive or depending on the page status usually. Audio worklet is also usually more re resilient because it has been designed so. For instance, there is no sync HR in audio worklet. There is sync HR in, in, in workers. Um, it's true that there, there are some things that, are, that might be missing in audio worklet compared to uh the breakout box model like control signals um i'm still unclear about its use it can probably be extended or shimmed um, that's my guess at least so we can probably uh discuss with your work like extensions so the proposal i would make there is that uh, there is consensus to work on raw video access and websites are very excited about it. So we should define it and uh, focus basically on that for V1. That does not mean that we will not come up with some audio media capture audio API later on. Uh, simply, there's already a solution that is working in all major browsers uh, and which seems good enough for now. Next slide, please. Um, so second slide is, uh, there's no surprise there. Uh, it's roughly the same thing as uh, WebRTC and server streams versus WebRTC and Codic Transform. Uh, the processing should be idly done off the main thread. Uh, but the current API in the proposal is main thread centric. Now, if main thread is blocked, uh, you can click on the link and you will see, uh, you will go to a WebKit bug. Uh, the WebKit bug was very simple. It was, uh, there was a bug, mainframe was blocked for, in, for some user gesture, and the rendering pipeline, even though it was fully off mainframe, was still posting tasks of one frame from the background thread to the main thread. If mainframe is blocked, then the frames are queued in the thread uh, queue. And that's bad. Uh, just to comment, this, this is what this is what I said. We had fixed. I no, don't I think don't think it's so. A valid criticism. So, I can I can look at the implementation, but uh, it's a very usual mistake. To so, for instance, I haven't looked at the code, but I can look at it. I can do some more experiments if that's needed. But there's a max buffer size parameter in media stream track uh, breakout box, and if you check max buffer size. At in the main thread, if you decide to uh, check max buffer size in the main thread, then you have this bug. 
So I don't know whether you are doing this max buffer size check in the main thread or in the thread that is generating the frames. Uh, usually Gedo? people... Gedo, you can answer that. Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, the, since Scrum 91, uh, media goes to... Um, media doesn't touch the, the, the main thread. So the, the question is, uh, if the worker, uh, where, where is done the back buffer size check, for instance? Is it done in where the readable stream lives, the, or is it done, it, it, so it's worker. done in the worker? So yeah. it can also be done in the main thread as well, if the readable stream is in the main thread. So you, you, you have that issue, uh, yeah, at yeah. least until the readable stream is transferred. Um, so yeah. that, that's something you should look at. Uh, I'm yeah, pretty sure yeah. of it. Yeah, uh, just, of course, it? you might have fixed it. What might, so let me just continue this slide, and, and then I will. Uh, you, you can you can follow up. Um, what I'm saying is that the current API is difficult to implement without main thread blocking risk. Uh, it's there's a signal here. Uh, Chrome had this issue apparently, but fixed it uh, recently. Chrome had this issue as well for WebRTC and suitable streams. I don't know if it's fixed or not. Maybe it's fixed, in which case that's good. Maybe it's not. Uh, the stream spec algorithm, when you transfer a stream from main thread to worker, is doing all its algorithm from the main thread. So there is blocking there. If, if you fixed it, then you're probably implementing something which is not the stream spec transfer algorithm. And this is something that is observable. Uh, and also there are edge cases that are hard to optimize. Like uh, if you have a max buffer size of 16, then you might buffer on the main thread 16 frames. Then you will transfer it, transfer it to the worker. The 16 frames will be uh, somehow transferred, but there will be a time potentially where from 16, you will go to 32, except if you're doing enqueuing in uh, the, fr the thread that is producing uh, the frames, which is a possibility. The additional case is if you T a readable stream. There, if you keep a stream in the main thread and a, and a stream in the worker, according to the algorithm of a stream spec, you have no way except then to pass the frames to the main thread. Um, so. All of that to say, it's hard to implement. Maybe you could get it right, but that's hard. And the benefits are not huge. We could do, you could slightly change the API so that implementers do not end up with those issues. And we would, could, we would be able to, uh, by slightly changing the API, define a specific algorithm that people, implementers would implement and at the end of the day, come with an of the main thread without main thread blocking uh, implementation. So the proposal is to envision of the main thread alternatives. Um, I'm very open to any proposal. Here, I just show one simple example that we, we, could, we could look at and we could compare it with the current proposal. The, so the example I'm taking is you, allowed you implement transferring of media stream track from workers or to workers. Uh, there was consensus at last in turn to investigate this. And this is probably shimmable in Chrome using a uh, transfer stream and breakout box. Um, and if you have a media stream track in a worker, then we might able, be able to add an API to expose frames in workers or worklets. And then the processing of media stream track content is done in workers or worklets. Uh, next slide. So I, I just did, did an example there. Uh, so the red things are what is missing in uh, today's browsers. So you set up a worker, you get user media, you get to track, and then you do post message track and you put track in the transferable. Uh, then you receive a message where you have a track. and you could do like this track and frame event, or you could get a readable stream or a writable stream from it, or you can do whatever you want. 
uh, I'm not proposing this on prime event, even though that's a one-liner, so why not? A uh, good thing there is that you have track on mute and track on unmute events. So it's actually quite good to be able in a worker to get the state of a media stream track and to be able to say, oh, I'm no longer receiving frame because I'm muted. Okay, that's good to know. Thanks, I will do something like send frames or I don't know. Uh, but you can do processing and it's much easier to do it there than to have to pipe these mute events from the main pro from the page to the work. Uh, next slide. Um, could could, uh, could I add yeah, a little uh, feedback before we move on? Uh, uh, next, previous so, slide, then, I guess. Um, it really, it's kind of feedback on the, on the, the previous two slides. Uh, ju just to, to harp on, on, on Guido's point, uh, that uh, we um, we have implemented this optimization of transferring w without uh, blocking on the main thread after the transfer occurs. Uh, in terms of like how hard a problem that was to solve, uh, like as, as a browser, um, this was done, uh, you know, by one engineer in, in under a week's time. Um, we have uh, confidence from, you know, the code that indeed it does uh, bypass the main thread entirely after the transfer occurs, but also uh, we produced uh, a, a pretty slick demo for, um, you know, a web page basically that, that does the transfer and then simulates uh, main thread contention by busy looping uh, in the main window. Uh, and then we verify um, the receipt of uh, frames on the worker. And, and we, we've demonstrated uh, that uh, the frames are, are not lost, uh, that, that, that no amount of main thread busy looping uh, affects the delivery of frames to the worker. Um, and uh, I think it could be uh, insightful for us to share that demo link. Uh, unfortunately, I'm in my phone right now, but uh, Guido and uh, Harold both have that link from uh, earlier discussion. If they could maybe paste it into the uh, meeting chat so that it could be recorded in the minutes and just available for everybody. Sure. What, what I'm saying is that what you implemented there um, might work in the general case. I, I guess that if you do post message uh, transfer, uh, this worker post message to the track, or the, the stream there, and then you're busy looping synchronously. Uh, then you might end up in potentially in some issues because some frames might still be in transit from the camera thread to the main thread. And then at some point, I'm guessing the main thread will actually send them back to the worker, but there will still be a time where they will be there sitting, uh, waiting for the main thread to actually forward them to the worker. So there are edge cases uh, that you probably will not be able to solve very easily. Although it's feasible, uh, you will need to, to spend more time there. And as I said, you probably implemented a very smart algorithm that is not what is defined in the stream uh, spec. And- The UN? The, yeah. The, this, as far as I understand, the optimization algorithm was, was implemented partly by the same person who wrote the transferable stream spec. Mm -hmm. That's correct. So, um, if, uh, so if, if you are claiming that he implemented something different from, from what he wrote, then either his writing was bad, bad or his code is bad, but you cannot argue that, uh, that uh, this algorithm is not actually not what was intended to be in the spec. I mean, one of us um, might have a bug, but uh, if, if, you're, if you're claiming that an edge case exists, then you need to show that the edge case exists and you need to show where, where it goes okay. in the spec because uh, I can I take an action. Wrong. I can take an action to actually follow up uh, after the meeting. I would mention uh, a simple case, which is you go from main, so you go from, you transfer from main page to worker and then from worker to back to the main page. And in that case, if you are, I would guess, uh, fully uh, not going through the worker and you close the worker, you track we will probably continue, which is nice, but it's not at, at per spec. Uh, the other thing so is if you, 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 are, you are positing behavior that I don't understand, even. Uh, I, 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 okay. I mean, if, you, if, you're, if you're claiming that 
if you're claiming that if you transfer a stream back to the from the worker to the main thread, uh, that it will congest because of operations on main thread. Yes, of course, no, you just asked it to. No, I don't understand your problem. That's well, not what I'm uh, maybe saying. I can help. <laughs> Um, so, so maybe I can take an action to to write precisely uh, after the meeting. Maybe Yonivar, you you could try to summarize what you understood. Well, maybe I was probably not clear there. I, I was just going to make a higher level uh, argument here, which is that if we want to avoid main thread, uh, we should also discuss what is the best API. I mean, uh, we know script processor node was a bad, a bad idea, so why are we talking about an API that? Expo we can say, oh, we're, we're exposing it to the main thread, but we're going to optimize it. User agents are going to optimize it so that never is on the main thread. Well, it seems the, the nicer API would be to avoid all that and simply transfer the media stream track to the worker so that we're not relying on user agent optimization for very necessary uh, behavioral properties. Yeah, I mean, so to transfer media stream track, you basically will have to do what the stream people did. So, so your proposal is basically to make media stream track Similar. Yes. Uh, however, and then after streams, after after we have stream track is is like streams, then we 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 operate on top of that. So, well, but it would also yeah. let yeah. us that, make that that we can yeah. as a starting point use streams, which is which already went there, and it's proven in production uh, uh, to have solved all, all those problems. And if we solve those problems uh, at the media stream track level. Which also operates on the main thread by by default, and we would need to transfer it just like we transfer a stream. Then we can we can evolve the API like we do with all APIs that, that we have and improve it. Uh, one difference, though, is that if we transfer the media stream track, we can then later make we can make decisions that say let's not expose this API at all uh, on main thread. If we uh, uh, that's not the, an option today, where we're part of the uh, exposure is on main thread. Um, well, I, I'm looking, at, I'm looking uh, at the clock there. I'm looking at the clock. It's uh, <laughs> yeah. so I'm, I'm planning there to finish my presentation. Then we can go back to to adoption, and I'm happy to take an action to uh, provide a, a deeper analysis or deeper examples. Anyway, um, so let's continue. Um, so yeah, just I just wanted to point out that existing APIs are heavily based on the data stream track, web audio, peer connection, video recordo, HTML media element. And for there, the pipe two implementation is uh, between all of these input and output. That that looks that looks pretty good. Um, if you look at media stream track and web codecs, uh, in, currently at least, the HGS that is executed for every audio video frame, either input or output. Uh, readable stream pipe two to the rescue, maybe. Uh, but again, uh, you, you might have issues um, with with main thread. And if you want to pipe the output of web codec to uh, a video element, uh, how will you do that? You probably need to do that in a worker and, and do things. Uh, so it seems that uh, there's a possibility to extend web codec to support media stream to act as input and output. And maybe that's something we should we should look at. Uh, next slide. Uh, so I, I just wanted to say, hey, why not taking encoder.encode and pass the stream track? Or why not the decoder could produce directly a track? And then you could very easily set it to the source object. That doesn't prevent. So this could be done maybe in the main thread, for instance, if we really want to, um, without issues of having very big objects being stuck in the main thread. Um, so that, that could be a, a possibility. Next slide. Oh, could, can, we, can we talk about that one for a minute? Uh, sure, go ahead. Um, so there's there's kind of two main points. Uh, you know, the previous slide says readable streams to the rescue, uh, which assumes that, that someone needs rescuing. Um, I want to say that from uh, like the, the having implemented uh, web codecs uh, as is defined with the access to every frame uh, and having heard feedback uh, from origin trial participants and having discussed uh, the uh, you know JavaScript um, uh, you know uh, 
with with the people who own Blink and V8, you know, and the, the timing requirements that Web Codex is going to need to be performant in this regard. Uh, th this is, uh, as, as far as I can tell, not an issue actually. That doing Codec IO um, on the main thread in a in a worker uh, in particular, let's say every ten milliseconds, uh, is 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 just fine. Um, and uh, the additional point I wanted to make is that. Uh, the suggestion uh, to use the media stream track instead of uh, every frame uh, works fine uh, if you want to just do straight pass through from uh, the user's camera, let's say, to the encoder. Uh, but actually, most users that we've talked to don't want to do just straight pass through. They want to instead do things like uh, background blur and background replacement or add funny hats and these sorts of things for which having access on a per frame basis is important. Um, and then they, they make their modification and then they feed that modified frame into the encoder. Of course, you could do things like modify the frame and then feed it back into a, a media stream track, which then goes into the encoder. But this seems like a lot of hoops to jump through and sort of like the argument that you touch less JavaScript this way uh, is, is definitely false. Um, uh, on the other side, of uh, coming out of the decoder, let's say, uh, that, that same sort of power to access uh, every frame uh, is, is also desired. Uh, we are supportive of uh, still you know, pursuing like the media stream track generator as a, as a way to, to render uh, media, uh, but, but also most of the folks that we've uh, spoken to in the origin trial prefer the lower level primitives of rendering their frames uh, themselves uh, via canvas, via audio worklet. This is a, a more powerful and, and actually kind of a more intuitive uh, way to go about it for folks who you know have spent you know a decade in, in video stacks and that sort of thing. Yeah, I, I agree with that. I think that uh, in general, it's perfectly fine to have like uh, per frame processing in worklets or in workers. What I'm what's meaning there is that if somebody wants to do the easy path and wants a main thread uh, API, then media stream track creation or piping to is probably fine and it's probably better than readable stream. Uh, Yaniva, you want to say something? Sorry, that, that was my hand from earlier. My only comment oh, would okay. be that uh, if, if you're going to have funny hats in a web conference, you probably want a selfie too, though, so you know how, what you're looking like. So maybe the real, uh, local real time case isn't that different from uh, encoding to, uh, to send. Yeah, but even your selfie would need the modified hat. Uh, and so you're still accessing your frame on a per frame basis. And, you know, again, my point stand, I think about, yes, you could feed that back into a track for the sake of like having the video element render it for you. But but why, you know, why not just render it yourself to Canvas directly? Well, if you, if there are some, so I'm saying both options are fine. If you look peer connection, peer connection, you need a track. So there, why not having something that is easy to use and that would not require JavaScript to be executed and that would be easy to implement by the user agent anyway. Uh, but let's go, we, we need to keep... Uh... You're muted, Yuan. Sorry. Um, control channel, yeah. Uh, in the interest of time, I will be uh, quick. Uh, I looked at the controlling channel and I did not really understand everything. I'm guessing that it's something that is still uh, under design, which is fine. Um, my proposal here would be to identify and document use cases before talking about API. Uh, next slide. Uh, I, I provided here some potential issues with the current API based on my understanding of what this API is trying to solve. Uh, I'm not quite sure I understood precisely everything it was trying to solve because uh, the details in the spec are, uh, it's not very detailed. I, I guess, of course, with uh, additional work, it could be detailed further. Uh, but anyway, th these are issues that uh, probably I should file uh, or we can discuss later later on. Next slide. Um, yeah, I was just wanting to mention another small issue with muted and tracks, for instance. So uh, signals that we're mentioning, like muted and it, maybe these are signals as well, but we already have something in the stream track. 
So it feels like something we we need more work there for signals. That's my understanding. That's my current feeling. Next slide. <laughs> um, yeah, let's keep this one. Uh, I want to go to the end anyway. Uh, so tentative summary from uh, my current reading. Um, a raw video media access API is a great idea. Uh, we, we are seeing people that really want it. Uh, audio, from what I'm hearing, there's no consensus currently uh, that it's needed or not needed. But it's something we, we, we need to continue debating. Uh, my understanding is that the WebRT working group is the right place to do this work because there is uh, knowledge in that area, so that's good. Um, the current proposal from Google uh, needs more work. That's my understanding. Um, I would tend to think that we should focus on video and core functionality for V1 and in parallel document additional requirements and use cases, for instance, audio controlling signals and uh, so on. I really think we should fix the other main thread thing before uh, uh, it, to me, it seems like a requirement. Uh, so that's it uh, for me. I'm guessing, uh, does somebody want to say something before we go back to the working loop adoption slide? Just as a matter of process, I do believe we have, uh, this is a two hour long meeting, correct? Correct. We yes. have an extra half hour, yes. Yeah, but we have a lot of items in that half hour, so. <laughs> sure. Yeah, uh, I, I would say I agree uh, with the UN. Um, I added one slide just to show that um, uh, I think uh, his, his main concerns of uh, making sure that this uh, we don't duplicate work with audio worklet and that we keep things off the main thread are both valid and uh, uh, I also hear the camp that wants uh, streams, um, but I don't think I think these can be done orthogonally. Uh, so, in the interest of uh, adding that that nuance, I, I modified some of UN's earlier examples by adding streams, uh, primarily for back pressure. So I just want to uh, add that back pressure doesn't necessarily mean buffering, and I believe that even in real time, uh, you might want to have uh, some kind of back pressure signal in order to implement your strategy, strategy whether that's uh, buffering or dropping frames. So I hope, hopefully that's something we can keep in mind and uh, maybe I uh, can bring parties more together. Um, and that, that, so I'm showing some examples here. Uh, and I think the rub here is that we're in a tricky spot where we we're dealing with very high uh, uh, priority real time on one end uh, but we're, it's bleeding into use cases where we might uh, want to do things like take real-time microphone audio and encoding it and sending it uh, through, for example, web transport, which is the first example here. Um, and in that case, um, being able to uh, know um, to, the, to the extent that audio worklets uh, callbacks are synchronous, uh, I think that we would need to expand on that so that uh, a producer of audio can also know when a callback, including its asynchronous parts are done in order to, uh, otherwise that's gonna leave a lot of, of up to the JavaScript application to figure out that if it's not done in time, it's gonna get called again. It's gonna need to use state and a lot of things in order to not potentially explode uh, uh, CPU and memory usage, that kind of things. So, yeah, so, so okay. I, I have a question about your uh, code example, Yanivar. I, I think sure. there's a bunch of subtle things in there. I mean, you're talking basically essentially about wrapping web codecs in a stream abstraction. But, um, you know, there is the issue of uh, changing the encoder rate. So I don't know that you can really do a pipe through like that that'll get all the way to web codecs, right? Uh, you you kind of have to feed back the, the rate the throughput of web codecs, some uh, web transport back into the web codex encoder rate. Um, All right. Well, well, as far as control signals that might come up there, yes. Uh, yeah. The 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 idea of using pipe, you don't have to use pipe two, but uh, the we have to solve this with datagrams in web transport, uh, which is the closest we have to real time networking. Yeah. And uh, uh, what we ended up with was that uh, instead, you know. You, uh, 
the earlier proposals we had, we had JavaScript just hammering on the write function in the loop uh, in order to fill the underlying sinks buffer in order to send datagrams. And then the implementation would drop as it saw fit. Uh, that was a bad design. We ended up with uh, using uh, uh, back pressure, and uh, but it it only it assumes that the producer is going to not just call writer dot write, but also await writer dot ready, oh, so that there's right. some there, way there's, of, the of avoiding. Uh, yeah. the of we have had uh, now one and a half hours, and we're like one third through the agenda. Yeah, sure. I, th I, I hope think, that answers I think we have uh, raised a number of issues here. I think I think uh, in ITF terms, I would suggest that we have to take this to the list. Yeah. When you say this, uh, you mean the adoption? I mean, I mean the adoption. Okay. Because uh, all the points that uh, I believe that I have a strong opinion on, all, on almost all the points raised. And I, it's clear that I don't agree with the people who have raised them, so we'll have to discuss this further. We don't have time on the two-hour two hour call for this. All right, so please put that in the minutes. Uh, we will take this discussion to the list. Okay, and then also, you, Yuan had mentioned he would provide some deeper examples. Should I add that too? Yeah, sounds good. Okay. Thank yep. you. And, uh, and demonstrate that the problems here is these are real and not just misunderstandings of the of, of the spec or the implementation sounds good um okay getting getting to webity and credit transform uh and hopefully it will not be uh, very long um so just as a recap the initial proposal uh when the draft was adopted was uh create and credit streams which makes it easier to do things in the main thread than of the main thread and the notion of transform was not very clear as well so the working group consensus was to move to a transform model and to define a script transform and a stream transform with other main thread processing by default. That's what is now in the spec and that's what is uh, avail available uh, behind a flag in uh, Safari as well. But we still have in uh, the uh, spec and also in Chrome, the create and code streams API, which is roughly doing the same it's the same purpose, right? Uh, it's trying to solve the same uh, purpose. So my proposal would be to uh, remove create and credit streams from the specification uh, as a way to complete the shift to a transform model. And as a bonus, I think that if we do that, I will be able to uh, define more precise algorithms that, uh, than what we have today. Put. I would just say yeah, that I think this there, is... there are there are cases of uh, use cases that don't fit the in the the transform model. I have tried to raise some of those earlier, but uh, uh, and there are also use cases that I, that I don't I think don't fit well with the with with the idea that the only thing that you can send uh, send the, your streams off to is 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 a is a worker so at the moment i disagree with making the currently pro the current apple proposal the, on the only api in the spec so i i worry about that um so i i asked for use cases and scenarios uh in the past and i haven't really seen them so it, it's difficult to make progress there so how 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 can we make progress there because that's slowing down uh, the specification and we certainly do not want to keep both i think we we all agree on that i would be more in favor of uh improving the script transform uh when we when we have the use cases that you're mentioning uh then uh, keeping the create and code streams uh, which is uh, which has known issues. Yeah, the the obvious use case is to the use case that doesn't fit with the transform is uh, is feeding a feeding the in, input the output from uh, 
from a receiver into into a web codec. You can do that uh, very easily in in the worker. You can even post message the, the chunks if you want to do that in the main thread as well. Yeah, I'm uh, yeah, never here. I'm generally supportive of UN's proposal here. I don't think we should have two APIs to do the same thing. I'm also uh, concerned about uh, main thread exposure. So this is a plus one for me. Other comments? I'm kind of in, in to Panton here. I'm kind of of the view that if we're introducing a new API, we should introduce them one at a time. Um, introducing two related APIs that are kind of 45 degrees to each other, they're not even orthogonal, is, is going to be super confusing to, to web developers who, again, wander into this. Um, I, I, I genuinely wouldn't know which of these to pick up for a given problem. Um, so giving people the option is kind of making a, a possibility for um, many mistakes, I think. So one option could be to separate the two uh, proper, like in two different specs. I think if we're doing that, we need to be clear about which use cases, which ones are solving. And then that allows people to say, hey, well, my use case looks like this. I should be using this, uh, this API. And my use case looks like that. And I should be using that API. If we don't do that, then people are just going to get super confused. Well, I'm confused already, so. Yeah, I agree that uh, use cases for main thread uh, access would be would be good to have. And, and and almost regardless, I mean, if we're exploring things like transferring media stream track, it seems like uh, if you really wanted main thread, uh, and we had transferable media stream track, you could you could do that. Right. You can transfer. Work the you can we, transfer. We, the we the transfer from from worker to main thread. So you, can, so you can just transfer, take them out in the worker and transfer them back. It's a hassle, right. but it's possible. Well, well, if there's, if if I'm the only one that uh, doesn't mm -hmm. doesn't think that this is the right uh, a right step to the right API, then I'll just drop my opposition and say, okay, merge it. Well, um, I I would like to talk through the use cases again because I I do agree with you, Harold, that there may be some that can only be handled via the encoded streams model. We Listing use cases and doing like a pros and cons might be helpful to really pinpoint what the, what the contention is about. So, right. um, we, we, we discussed that in, in the past, and uh, the idea was uh, for, to, to get use cases for main thread access. And so far, I haven't seen use cases uh, that could not be fulfilled by the script transform. And we know from the fact that uh, the main thread is good, and that most people like it. So we have advantages there, for sure. And we don't know any use case that cannot be fulfilled with the script transform so far. So if they are, I'm fine looking at them and discussing them, but I uh, haven't looked, I haven't gotten any right now, until now. It sounds like an action item would be needed to come up with that or to drop it. Yep, sounds good. Yeah. So I'm, I, I'm in uh, at the moment I'm in favor of uh, favor of just just removing the removing the old old API and given the the sense of the room yeah my, my oh, sense I is that I mean the, the design point that we shouldn't have two apis very similar to do the, you know very similar things with like a complex caveat about whether it's on thread or thread um I think that points toward removing the duplicate API no matter what. And if the main thread use case do emerge and cannot be solved with the current design, then we should have that new conversation. But, but the fact that we came up initially with this and now have a better proposal for off thread discussion, I think means we shouldn't feel married to this uh, original design. Yeah, I, I think that would definitely be progress. Can I get clarification on the action item, come up with or drop what specifically? 
I, I, to, think the, I think the the consensus right now is to drop the API and also uh, make sure to gather quickly use cases uh, for main thread access that would potentially require uh, either reintroducing the old API or changing the new one. So specifically, you want to spell it out though, drop the create encoded streams API, right? In yep. favor of the transform API. Okay. Uh, so um, I do have a, a an issue number 89, which has that very few comments. Uh, Okay. All right. Uh, yeah, I think we ahead. need to um, skip this one. I think that uh, we should go to the next items. Um, because okay. We're already late. Yeah, we'll hand it over to you, Yanni uh, Bar. All right. So this is uh, 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 Get Viewport Media. Just want to, I wasn't sure that I would have time to present this today. So slides are going to be short. Um, uh, some good news. Uh, I presented some good news last time too. So this is an incremental update. Uh, I, I believe we have mostly agreement about from the the main interested parties that we could hopefully have consensus as well of only yeah so background get viewport media since we have a larger audience it's a uh, it's an alternative to get display media get display media uh, is screen sharing of whatever the user picks get viewport media is narrowly defined uh, the problem with get display media was it has specific security risks in capturing web surfaces that can be used to uh, attack the same origin policy and that kind of stuff. So get viewport media in a nutshell is uh, uh, a new API that web pages can basically capture themselves, quote unquote. And um, in order for that, a lot of the same uh, uh, security risks would exist if we allowed uh, pages with iframes of cross origin content that could be exposed, uh, including rendered content and uh, rendered iframes with information that was uh, populated with your local cookies for all kinds of websites. So uh, we all agreed uh, now that we need to secure this API behind site isolation. It means only expose this get viewport media method if the, you have window.cross origin isolated, which is uh, the co-op plus co-op uh, security uh, model. Um, so I think there's agreement now with uh, on that. And we've also agreed that uh, uh, resources other than iframes are on their own because they were, would be vulnerable to specter attacks anyway if they're uh, rendered into the process. Um, and also earlier we discussed failure modes and uh, there's also agreement that uh, rather than dropping capture, uh, it generalizes better to just block loading entirely of uh, frames that haven't opted in. Uh, so what the so that's all great, uh, but we still need to agree on the shape of the, we need an additional opt-in header, opt-in to capture that documents that are in iframes can specify to say they agree to be captured. And there was another proposal there. There was the, we found some problems with, there were two proposals. One was to add a, an HTML-capture header attribute to a, to a co-op as part of a co-op required corp. Um, the the problem is that uh, co-op, which is the embedder policy, its uh, its original model was to present the web the way it was supposed to be. The web present the web the way it was supposed to be. If we had designed the web from the ground up, this would be the safer model. Now HTML capture is a less safe in some respects model, and that that can be confusing because you're now opting into riskier, not safer profiles. And uh, Chrome security also pointed out that uh, it would probably require a fetch metadata uh, request as well, uh, sec fetch co-app or something like that. And it got complicated. So the proposal from uh, Chrome security was to introduce a an off by default document policy instead. And that would let us have, uh, that seems cleaner uh, in that the top level, level document could then have a required document policy 
of HTML capture, meaning that any iframe for any iframe to load, those iframe documents must say document policy HTML capture. So they they opt in. Otherwise, they will not load. And that this avoids having to define separate fetch metadata request headers. So that's the I think the proposal on this. Um, questions, thoughts on any of this? Uh, so we can figure out if we have consensus. Uh, I think there are no questions. I think we can continue. All right. So does that mean we have a consensus on all? Can we record consensus on those items listed? Well, it depends. You, you said that there is a proposal from Chrome Security. Are you saying that you would like to accept this proposal of a document policy instead of a co-op header? Well, I think, um, uh, well, so on the items before that, I think uh, it sounds like we have consensus. On the last proposal, I think uh, Mozilla is favorable. Uh, the only issue we have, unfortunately, the document policy hasn't been uh, fully uh, um, adopted yet. That's why it's an incubator spec at the moment. So with that caveat in mind, I think uh, if we can resolve that internally and get a uh, an updated position on document policy, I think uh, it seems like a reasonable approach. So I, I think yes with the, that caveat on the last item. Uh, are there any objections to this? Uh, not an objection, just uh, by shading HTML capture might be better referred to something with viewport in it, like viewport capture or something. Sure. Yeah, bike shading. Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah, I would also like to bike shed on HTML dish capture, but uh, in the interest of time, I would prefer to do it uh, separately. Also, uh, it's not going to be the end of the world for me if it's called HTML capture. Names are uh, notorious. Everybody, all names are bad. Yeah, fair enough. I think we're getting consensus on direction here. So I just wanted to add some slides about um, um, requiring, uh, there's still the problem of uh, sites, even on same origin sites that uh, they may be able to harvest user information uh, from things like uh, uh, browser history from link purpling and that kind of stuff, uh, forms and uh, the, uh, so there's still gonna be a permission uh, gating on this feature and we're hoping to require a lot of the same protections that get display media has um, use a gesture and not storing a granted permission having uh, required privacy indicators uh, and additionally uh, uh, require permission to use uh, explain to the user the risks and also probably disallow things like iframe.content window get the uh, get uh, viewport media Sorry, it's an old uh, typo there, a uh, previous name. And uh, there's also a risk of, even though we wanna let user agents uh, give the option to sanitize information, that's a double-edged sword because if you sanitize that way, important extensions like ad blockers, we could risk, we don't wanna accidentally create an ad blocker, blocker mode. Um, and uh, the last one is there was some contention around uh, originally, we said we should mute pause while the document was not visible out of security concerns because uh, the site could then go to town and, and show all kinds of links and uh, rendering patterns to try to deduce uh, large amounts of user information. Uh, however, uh, in contrast to that, the, you know, uh, the, a lot of the use cases might involve capture from tabs that aren't necessarily visible. So there are uh, decisions we can make there that maybe the tab needs to be visible at the point that you're uh, requesting permission, but we'll, uh, you probably, but if you wanna go to a different site and look at the uh, Wikipedia page while you're presenting, maybe a capture shouldn't stop. And for reference, I think Chrome and both Chrome and Firefox behind Pref allow capture of background tabs at the moment uh, in get display media, so. There are also some use cases there that, uh, so this is still unclear, I guess. And uh, I don't know if anyone has points. 
uh, to that. And I think um, the I'm just going to move to the next slide. Um, also, there's an issue about cropping, and there's a proposal here to basically instead of generating scripts and tracks, uh, uh, instead of generating media that needs cropping, maybe uh, add tools build into the capturing API itself so that they can narrowly specify something that needs to be captured so that you don't need to have crop it later. And so uh, this is an iteration of what I proposed in the past, which is that we capture the intersection of the viewport of the top level browsing context active document and the document, say iframe, that is requesting the capture for the smallest uh, visible surface which is beneficial because we end up only capturing uh, what the user sees rather than the entire page or the entire iframe. Um, and the that also means that you capture all everything that might be on top of that iframe. So it's, it's really just a clipping API. So it doesn't totally solve that the an iframe can capture its parent, uh, but it probably does it in, uh, except in, uh, Odd uh, in odd edge case, uh, cases where the top level page would purposely overlay something on the iframe. And um, mm -hmm. we've also discussed transferring media stream track um, in the previous meeting. So uh, the idea I'm, I'm floating here is that instead of allowing the capture by others, that we limit capture to yourself, your own document, and that if uh, to solve edge cases where an application, a sub application lives in one iframe versus the capture target lives in a separate iframe, that we basically ask the target to capture itself and transfer the media stream track over. I think that seems uh, a more conservative starting point to get the discussion going. And it would allow a top level page to delegate iframe capture to iframes without itself opting into being captured uh, implicitly. And uh, that's it. Um, so I would like, uh, oh, uh, if we could stay uh, on the same one before we go here, uh, just for a second. Uh, so two points were raised, which I uh, am not so sure about. Uh, so first of all, was that um, I don't think that there is any problem with capturing uh, the top level page by an embedded page, because this uh, permission is actually delegated, right? We've got the HTML, this capture that we uh, wish to rename. So of course, that's part of it. And second is that even if you only allow the iframe, if you clip to the iframe itself, the top level could still draw something above it. So kind of teaching the web developer that it's okay, you're just capturing the iframe. Um, that is a misleading lesson that could backfire if uh, only understood uh, after things hit production. So I think that this could be confusing. Uh, additionally, uh, if we could go to the next uh, slide, um, I think that there is a typical use case uh, that we're all experience, almost experiencing right now. We're all together in a VC and we're all watching uh, slides present, uh, being presented to us. And I think that there is a reason, uh, there is a um, sense in uh, structuring an application so that the presentation software would be the top level under certain circumstances. Uh, and then you've got a VC uh, pane on the side, uh, which is its own frame. And when that is the case, uh, there is one reason why you would still want to call get viewport uh, media or get display media from the iframe uh, of the VC. And that is that you can then use restrict on video and you can then immediately get rid of all of the audio that's coming in through the VC and you're, you would not be transmitting it back into the VC. And note that you would sometimes want to capture and also share audio, especially if you've got you know, YouTube uh, media content or any other type of media content that you're capturing and you want to stream to other participants. Uh, so I think that there is sense there. And also there is the general um, opposition to making things transferable, not being as easy uh, as it might initially appear. So these are the things I wanted to raise on that topic. A quick question about restrict on audio. So let, let's say you capture a specific iframe. Would it be only the audio of the iframe or would it be the audio of the whole page? 
what's what's your scope there? So a restrict no, restrict on audio as it is currently specified says that uh, the document that calls this uh, captures the entire um, surface, including audio, but does not capture its uh, the audio that it itself is producing. Uh, I think that uh, Henrik Bustrom is here, and I think that he was involved in originally uh, specifying this, so maybe he could give a better uh, summary of what it says. Uh, it currently says that the user agent must attempt to remove any audio from the audio being captured that was produced by the document that performed get display media. Uh, so it's a document wide. Uh, so it's not page wide. It, it's not page wide, no. Okay. So if right. the VC iframe in this case were to call this, then it will end to supply this uh, constraint and it would mean that only the audio from the VC would get stripped away from the capture. Am I correct? Uh, it, I think it would, uh, would remove any audio from, but so I'm confused because you're, you would be capturing a part of the same page. So by definition, I think this constraint would just remove any audio. Um, let's, uh, reframe this as if we were talking about get display media if you uh, call get display media and you choose your own tab uh, and you're capturing with audio if restrict on audio were to remove all of the audio on the page then restrict on audio would never make any sense right uh, the, or the, audio original, could only be applied the original use case was that because in the original use case you could not restrict what uh, is being captured so this, the, the intent was to remove any echo in the event where you're actually capturing the same tab that is playing out the audio from the conference. Uh, if, we actually want, a... if we actually want to capture a, a part of a, a page, then it might become relevant uh, which audio being I, is muted. So uh, I think this kind of comes before we even decide about capturing a part of the page, right? Like because. Uh, in the way the way I see it, we uh, crop the video later, right? But suppose that we weren't cropping anything. If you're calling this from a side from an iframe, it I think it only re should only remove the audio that comes from that very iframe or its descendants. Uh, I yes, I think so. That would be the okay. And that, and if that is the case, then my argument stands that it makes sense for a VC application to say, hey, I'm capturing all of the tab or the window or the screen, but I'm capturing all of the tab, but I'm just removing the audio that I am producing myself. And that leaves us only with the media content that comes from the presentation, which is exactly what we want. Yes, I believe that, I believe that is correct. However, I think uh, that was the intent. At the same time, I think in earlier slides for cropping, I proposed by being more targeted in, in what we capture for video, we avoid cropping. And I would say the same thing here by being more targeted about what audio we're capturing in the first place, we uh, remove the need for uh, occlusions like restrict on audio. But uh, I think Tim had his hand raised. Uh, yeah, just kind of saying that this uh, illustrates the um, differences between video and audio quite starkly and and it's the sort of this is the sort of problem that I would choose to solve in in web audio rather than to push it down into the user agent um, like specifically which tabs audio goes where is the sort of thing that exactly uh, matches to what you can do well in web audio and, and I think I'm kind of disinclined to make it a spec item but uh, I guess that's not my problem really and uh, yeah I'm glad Henrik is here because I also struggle with I'm pretty sure that when we defined restrict on audio, we weren't even thinking about iframes. So I think the intent there was good. The intent was always to allow an application like this to capture things other than itself. And I think we can uh, we can uh, iterate on if that ends up not working correctly for iframes. I think that's something we can iterate on. But it seems specific to. I just want to avoid the tail wagging the dog here because we're talking about a specific detail of audio which I think we haven't even fully explored whether get viewport media would even capture. I'm not necessarily uh, saying we shouldn't capture audio, but uh, it seems uh, 
Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I agree that this does not uh, thoroughly resolve the issue. I mean, we could always uh, change restrict tone audio. I don't think it's implemented in any browser yet anyway. So it is a limited uh, argument that I'm producing here. Yeah, I, I just remember from the discussion that like the intent was to not capture audio if that would produce uh, echo. But when we talked about these constraints, it seemed very platform specific and source specific whether or not you would be able to distinguish different parts producing audio. So we added uh, uh, a clause saying that if you're not able to adequately remove the undesired audio, then the user agent should just mute the stream entirely. Uh, so the whole, the whole problem with iframes, I think is not fully explored. The point of the constraints is to avoid echo and uh, but we could revisit this with iframes if that's necessary. I guess uh, I see that we're uh, somebody is navigating forward, uh, and but we're at time. I'm happy to stay, but I'm not sure. I don't think other people would be. Yeah. Uh, think... Okay. Just go ahead. Yeah, I think I think we're out of time for the capture handle discussion. Uh, Apologize, uh, Elad. Um, so just on the slides we just covered then, uh, I didn't hear any major objections to this overall direction other than with the uh, last slide of restrict on audio from Elad. Is that a fair assessment? Uh, yes, but uh, we, so if you could go one slide above, then I, I think that we, uh, I'm sorry, one slide uh, before uh, earlier, not uh, later. Uh, this, uh, saying that we will only capture the part the iframe i understand Let, let's avoid the iframes intersection etc basically let's assume for simplicity that all of the iframe is visible so you're only capturing the iframe and whatever the top level document happened to have drawn on top of it uh i don't think that's a good design and i don't think that fits as well uh and even if my argument with uh, audio was not the most convincing uh we've got other arguments all right, thanks. All right, I think we're done for this month. Uh, please, everyone, fill in the Doodle poll for next month so we can select a day and time. I think probably we might have to go two hours uh, next month as well. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. And thank you, Nick, for scribing. I'll post it in the um, IRC chat. <laughs>